Stories that are false can circle the internet for years. For example, did you know that a megachurch called Temple Baptist was built on land that cost 57 cents, the amount donated by a ragged little girl in Sunday school? Did you hear about the guy who died in his sleep, killed by his own farts? Can you believe that Elvis Presley said, the only thing a nigger can do for me is buy my records and shine my shoes? And guess what? Scholars at the Smithsonian have uncovered writings of Nostradamus that relate to Barack Obama. These statements are all hogwash, but each of them is the heart of a viral email, which means each has some quality that makes people forward it over and over and over. The first is a kind of message commonly known as glurge, two sweet-to-be-true stories that nevertheless give many of us a warm feeling or even chills. The second makes us laugh and piques our sense of morbid curiosity. The third appeals to our contradictory fascination with celebrities, which includes a desire to tear them down. The fourth appeals to our yearning for magic. These stories are all drawn from the urban legends fact-finding site, Snopes. What is the common theme? Emotional arousal, something they share with viral religions. Comparing religion to chainmail may seem crass, but the kinship is real. Religions and viral stories have a variety of reproductive strategies. Like computer viruses, many chain mail and social media messages contain explicit copy me commands. Some emails promise us good luck if we forward the message to 10 people before the day is up, or a week of happiness or even prosperity. Some threaten us with bad luck if we don't. A religion may promise eternal life or eternal torture. Some viral messages try to shame us. If you care about your friends, you'll pass on this information about cervical cancer or visa fraud or brown recluse spiders. But most of the time, the pressure is more subtle. Most viral messages and images simply contain something that makes us want to pass them on. They make us laugh or feel validated and righteous. Many delight us. A few tap our sense of mystery or transcendence. At different points, religions make use of each of these. In the field of medicine, epidemiologists study patterns of viral transmission. You may have glimpsed the tools of their trade in the thriller movie Contagion. Experts can track, for example, how an influenza virus spreads across one region and how it jumps from country to country in the bodies of specific carriers. Based on the way infections fan out, they may even be able to identify the epicenter of a disease. Some of the tools of epidemiology are now being applied to study the spread of viral ideas, including religions. Scholars debate whether viral ideas can be thought of as discrete, self-replicating information modules known as memes. Are humans passive hosts, or do our brains take a more active role in reconstructing contagious ideas from hazy blueprints? Either way, the ideas get transmitted through established social networks. They spread horizontally within a generation and vertically from generation to generation, exploiting our desire to share what we know and to learn from each other. That is why specific religions are concentrated in one part of the world or another and children tend to have the same religion as their parents. For developmental reasons, children are particularly susceptible to simply accepting the ideas of their parents and community. If a parent says, stoves burn you, cars can squish you, and bathing keeps you from getting itchy, kids tend to do best if they simply trust what they are told. Nature has designed kids to be credulous. This allows them to learn from the experience of their elders in an efficient way. It helps them to acquire valuable information and adapt to cultural norms. It is also why evangelical parents are encouraged to convert their children young. Research on identity development shows that if children can be contained within an enveloping religious community through their transition into young adulthood, few will ever leave. As the ancient writer said, Bring up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. In the past, religions spread largely by edict and conquest. 
This is how Christianity spread throughout the Roman Empire and into the Americas. Today, though, religion is perceived as an individual choice and religions must gain share by attracting adherents. That is why, today, the religions that are gaining mindshare are those that have good marketing and what economists call appealing club goods or member privileges. In the current environment, Christianity has been able to produce offshoots that need no edict or conquest. Significantly, the religions that are growing right now are ones with strong copy-me commands. Evangelical Christianity is centered on the Great Commission, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. The Roman Catholic Church latched onto the strategy of competitive breeding, keep women home, sanctify a high birth rate, and evangelicals in the so-called quiverful movement have begun promoting this form of copy me command as part of their own competitive mix. By contrast, modernist Christianity is more often centered on what Christians call the great commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. In a changing environment, a virus or religion must have the ability to mutate and adapt. As knowledge grows, some varieties of Christianity accept new scientific or historical findings and reinterpret their sacred texts and traditions in light of our best understanding of the world around us. Tangentially, this is the approach taken by Tibetan Buddhism. The 14th Dalai Lama has said, If science proves some belief of Buddhism wrong, then Buddhism will have to change. In my view, science and Buddhism share a search for the truth and for understanding reality. By learning from science about aspects of reality where its understanding may be more advanced, I believe that Buddhism enriches its own worldview. The need to adapt may seem at odds with the recent success of fundamentalism, but in actual fact, fundamentalism is an adaptation to a changing world. Rather than revising dogmas, fundamentalists have developed a stronger defense against external threats. An extreme example of this can be seen in the case of the Amish, or Hasidic Jews. The belief system sustains itself relatively unchanged by prompting people to recreate the ancestral environment in which the beliefs crystallized. But most theological fundamentalists have a more hybrid approach. Parents protect their children from external influence in home schools or parochial schools, but don't mind accessing creationist materials from interactive websites. Megachurches provide in-house social services that include pop psychology. Advocacy organizations promote hierarchy and sexism, but are willing to have women and children as spokespersons for those views. Creationists play up the risk of doubt and inquiry, and yet use pseudoscientific findings to make their arguments convincing. Fundamentalist populations resist ideological change, but they have learned to exploit popular culture, best business practices, new technologies, and even scholarship itself to maintain the survival of their beliefs. Since a virus and host fit together like lock and key, understanding viral ideas helps us to understand the human mind and vice versa. Retroviruses and influenza mutate rapidly, which makes it hard to develop immunizations against them. On the spectrum of religions, Christianity shows a similar flexibility, regularly spinning off new sects, denominations, and even non-denominational renegades. Christianity has adapted to a broad range of human minds and cultures, a strategy that has resulted in success beyond the wildest visions of the patriarchs. <laughs>